here at the University of Guelph. It belongs to Professor Pat Wright. And this is where most of the fish that I got tissue from to use in my research were raised. So I needed blood so that I could annualize the genome size of each species using its blood. And other people needed different tissues of different fish for different research. So whenever a fish was euthanized uh, to provide tissue for research, I would get the blood and other people would get other tissues that they needed. For instance, gill tissue was a big one. A lot of these fish came into the aqua lab as eggs because annual killifish, one of the defining characteristics of them is they are able to dry out as eggs and still survive and hatch. So they got shipped here to the aqua lab in substrate in a bag from different researchers or different fish breeders. And then once they got here to the aqua lab, I put them in some water and then they hatched out. and. When they're very small, they need live food. Uh, it's very small live food, so we hatch out brine shrimp here at the Rivulus colony to feed the fish on a regular basis. And once they grew up big enough, they would be uh, euthanized for various research, usually after they reached a certain age and had already spawned, because we always try to get them to breed first so that we can continue on the population in the Rivulus colony. So this is an egg from Poropanchex normani, which is a type of African lamp eye killifish. And they swim into the mop to lay their eggs, and it also works nicely as a place to hide. So here on the left, we have a species of Gudeid. They are truly viviparous. They give birth to live young, and while the young are developing inside the mother's body, they feed them using a placenta-like structure, much like a mammal. And here on the right, we have Xiphophorus alvarezi. They're a type of posiliad, and they also give birth to live young, but the difference is they're ovoviviparous, which means they just hold their eggs inside of them until their eggs hatch, and then they just let the babies out. So this is a Fungilopanchax justedi pair. They are otherwise known as the blue galaris. They are a non-annual species of killifish native to Africa. And you can see the male there, he is very, very colorful. And the female there, she is rather drab. And they are much like many species of bird, where the male is brightly colored to attract the female, and the female is drab to make it easier to hide from predators. So this is a Simpsonichthys margaritatus. It's a type of South American annual killifish. And this here is a little male, and you can tell that because he's got those beautiful colors to show off to the ladies. So this is the scope room. This is where I go once I have blood from each fish on a microscope slide, and I've stained it to actually analyze the genome size of each species. And the way this actual process of analyzing genome size works is it uses a technique called Fulgen image analysis densitometry. Uh, so you stain the blood on the microscope slide using a shift reagent, which is a stain, and that stain stains the DNA on the slide selectively, and then you shine a light through the slide, and based on how much light goes through versus how much light gets absorbed by the stain, you can calculate genome size because the amount of stain is proportional to the amount of DNA. And you do that in relation to a standard, so chicken blood and rainbow trout blood that you already know the genome size of. So there are a few correlations that are believed to exist between genome size and different phenotypic traits in animals. One is metabolic rate, and the idea behind that is that a smaller cell has a higher surface area to volume ratio, and so an animal can metabolize faster if things can diffuse in and out of the cell more efficiently with a higher surface area to volume ratio. And the other one is developmental rate, because if the degree of complexity of an organism developing is the same between two organisms, then the one that has less DNA to copy every time its cells divide can actually develop faster because the cells need to divide during development quite a bit. Also, 
it has been hypothesized in fish that genome size may be positively correlated with degree of parental care in that uh, if you already have a larger genome size to begin with, you can only produce larger embryos because each of the cells in that embryo are going to be physically larger. And if you can only produce embryos that are on the larger side, then you can only produce fewer of them because more energy goes into making each, and therefore there's a greater uh, selection pressure evolutionarily to uh, protect each of those embryos and ensure each one of them, uh, or try to ensure each one of them makes it to maturity. So my main research questions were, how does annualism as a lifestyle affect genome size in killifish, and how does live bearing as a life history trait affect genome size in killifish. In my fish, I thought that the live-bearing killifish, the ones that give birth to live young, would for that reason have larger genomes because it's a type of parental care, and I thought that the annual killifish, annual killifish are the ones whose eggs are able to survive drying out, would have larger genomes as well because they have a period when they're dried out where they have a very low metabolic rate and almost no development so their genome size isn't constrained and it's free to expand and what I found was yes the annual killifish have larger genomes on average than the non-annual killifish and with the live bears what I found was that the ones that are truly viviparous, the ones that feed their offspring through a, a placenta-like structure like a mammal while they're developing inside the mother have larger genomes on average but the ones that just hold their eggs inside of them until they hatch and then they release the babies out uh, the oviviparous ones they have smaller genomes on average so it points to possibly needing to uh, quantify the degree of parental care and see how that is connected to genome size, not just a binary no parental care or parental care thing, live bearing or egg laying. So this research has left a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, one is the whole thing about how one needs to quantify the degree of parental care, quite possibly, before one can draw any conclusions about uh, genome size and its effects on the evolution of parental care, because as I said, the ones that have more parental investment in their offspring have the larger genomes, and the ones that have less parental investment in their offspring have the smaller genomes. And the other question is um, merely expanding the data set if this will reveal that annual killifish as a whole definitely have larger genomes on average when you look at all the different annual genera, not just the ones that I've looked at here, because there are one or two in Africa, but then there are like six or eight uh, independent evolutions of that annual lifestyle in South America, and I want to look at them all. And the other question is, uh, how does internal fertilization affect genome size? Because there are some species that do not give birth to live young, but still do internally fertilize, as opposed to just broadcasting their sperm and eggs out into the water like most species of fish do and whether uh, there's any relation between cell size and those life history strategies and because genome size impacts cell size whether there's any influence genome size has um, on those strategies or those strategies have on genome size.